Chris got his uh, PhD in material science at MIT about 20 years ago, worked at some startups and joined Lincoln Lab about 10 years ago, and uh, has been working uh, on imagers. Uh, he's assistant group leader now in the Advanced Imager Group, which has had a long history of populating terrestrial and uh, space-borne telescopes of many different kinds. And Chris is going to describe the, the pursuit of, of those imagers over that time. So thank you for that introduction, Rich. I'll say that Lincoln was my first real job. Um, uh, I worked at startups where, you know, the average company size was, you know, maybe 10 ish people. And um, there weren't that many, there wasn't a deep bench of expertise. And I remember vividly my uh, phone interview at Lincoln. So the story is um, a little personal, but uh, my, I had two young children. My wife gave me a phone call, said uh, she was at a, a doctor's appointment. We knew she was pregnant. She said, we're having twins. And I laughed, uh, I bought life insurance, uh, I bought a minivan and I got a real job. And uh, I, I was done with the startup uh, scene by that point anyway. Um, it had kind of run its course for me. But I remember vividly my phone interview um, with the group leader of the group I'm in now at the time. And uh, within five minutes, I realized how smart she was and how prepared I needed to be for my interview because Lincoln has a bench of thousands of really smart people. And it's one of the great things about working here. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking about the groups, some of the group's history and looking forward in developing imagers, mainly focused on CCDs, charge coupled devices. I'll talk about them at length in this talk. Um, so a bit of heritage, a bit of forward looking work. Uh, one slide on what Lincoln is. So. Before I joined the lab, I would say my view of Lincoln is we kept a very low profile. Um, there are 4,000 people employed here. Uh, most of them are at the, the Lexington campus. We have some field offices as well. I probably collectively those field offices employ less than 200 people. And uh, we are an, a uh, federally funded research and development center. Our closest analogs that you may have heard of would be Sandia or Jet Propulsion Laboratory, but those are respectively DOE and NASA FFRDCs. We're an Air Force FFRDC. And uh, we have uh, a mix of mission areas, um, but we also have this division advanced technology where I work, where the, uh, you know, the R&D arm, if you will, of the laboratory. Um, and then finally, we're managed by MIT um, and in fact, some of our closest collaborations are with scientists and engineers on the MIT campus. So I'm in Advanced Imager Technology, one of the, the groups in the Advanced Technology Division. Um, there's probably on the order of 40 or 50 technical groups. You can think of them as semi-autonomous business units in the lab. Um, I guess one other thing I'll point out about the lab, uh, there's not a, a section in the federal budget that gives us that billion dollars. There's a, a very small amount of money that's allocated for research, but for the most part, it's done by having uh, ideas, having uh, better ways to do things that are already done and uh, you know, convincing people to fund development of that technology. Um, so it's kind of an amazing thing to think about that essentially the entire thing is is uh, PhD you know, staff members writing research grants or, or meeting with people and convincing them to make an investment. Um, okay, so again, I'm an advanced imager technology. We have a few main thrusts. We build uh, detectors for uh, visible infrared and X-ray photons. We build readout circuits that convert uh, those analog signals into bit streams that can then be processed. And we've started to maybe upwards integrate a little bit and think more about the application. Um, I think it's a, there's kind of two ways to think about the world. So one, one view is, you know, the happy accident view. I'm a, I'm a big fan of that, by the way, where you, you don't have a, a very strong idea of the applications for the technology you're developing. You just have a nose that it's going to be useful someday. And sometime in the distant future, it turns out to change the world. Uh, there is another way to do research, right? It's to, it's to think of a problem that needs to be solved. And then from the top down, think of how you might solve that problem and invest in that. 
And that's what that, that right hand um, set of bullets is really pointing at, is we, we started to think along those lines as well. I'm gonna primarily talk about CCDs, but I'll touch on the other detector technologies uh, uh, mentioned here. So first I'm gonna just do a little bit of, uh, I'll say humble bragging. Uh, much of this work predates my time at the lab. So I'm really bragging about the people that came before me, which is how I can morally justify doing that. Um, but you know, I, I'm really proud of what the lab has accomplished and some of my coworkers, many of whom are still here. Uh, one of the really cool things about the lab is people work here a long time. And uh, that gives you a really great set of people you know, with this long history of developing technology. And so um, I think it's a very efficient way of doing things. You can, you can turn to them and they can point out, oh, we had that idea in you know, 1995 and it never went anywhere for this reason, but maybe today it would work because, you know, for example, fabrication technique has gotten more advanced. So uh, this is just a one chart overview of some of the uh, observatories that are using Lincoln Laboratory CCDs. Again, that's a charge couple devices. I'll go into how they work later in this talk. Uh, I have deeper dives into some of these coming up, so I won't highlight all of them. A couple that I, I am not highlighting here, I'll, I'll just point out on the chart, the Space Surveillance Telescope. So this is uh, a telescope that was developed uh, for the Air Force to look at near-Earth objects, satellites, uh, in, uh, for example, in low Earth orbit. And what's cool about this is the uh, actual detectors are curved. Um, so if you've ever uh, you know, played with a computer chip, you know it's a rigid bit of material, the silicon. Um, we were able to create detectors that are curved and that simplified uh, the telescope design and uh, eliminated some of the trade-offs involved in that. So that Space Surveillance Telescope was originally in New Mexico and has, has since actually moved to Australia. Um, and then another kind of unique application I'll point out, uh, highlighted here is the National Ignition Facility at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. So these are the people that are doing nuclear fusion with uh, lasers. There's 192 lasers being aimed at this capsule called a whole rum that's about the size of a peppercorn. And inside that uh, contains isotopes of hydrogen. And uh, we built these imagers that were able to take very high speed snapshots of what happens when you blast this little capsule with high energy lasers. Before I go into some of these observatories we enabled, I thought this was a a really good sort of context setter. Um, this is a, taken from a, the uh, Decadal Survey public briefing. Um, this is from the 2020 Astrophysics Decadal Survey, which actually only came out last year due to COVID. But this just shows some of the uh, sources, uh, the astrophysical light sources. And you can see that if you look at this uh, logarithmic scale on the bottom, they span 10 orders of magnitude in uh, wavelength or frequency. Um, and much of them require uh, space-based observatories to see. That is our atmosphere uh, absorbs the radiation. Um, so that's one of the main reasons that we fly space telescopes. I'm not gonna talk about the left-hand edge of this. That's the domain of radio astronomy. I have uh, little to no expertise in that, um, but I'll talk about the stuff more to the right. Uh, I wanted to highlight how insignificant the optical band is in the grand scheme of things. Of course, it's very important to us, um, but you can see that little, uh, I'll try to move my mouse pointer over it, that little banner there, that is the roughly 400 to 700 nanometer wavelength range that spans the optical band. Uh, by the way, if you're, if you're paying attention, the astronomers are a little bit more fast and loose with their definitions of wave bands, which is why this uh, optical and UV tends to overlap. So uh, the astronomers call the optical band something slightly different than what we would call it. Uh, nevertheless, you can see it's, it's a very narrow wavelength range compared to all of the other wavelengths available um, for astronomical surveys. The detectors that we build can uh, detect a wide range of frequencies um, so that with just our silicon CCDs that I'll be talking about, we can span about four orders of magnitude 
of wavelengths. And, and this is the area where we look. So these are tend to be higher energy photons than uh, radio or infrared. And they span the optical ultraviolet and into the X-ray band. Uh, I want to talk briefly about observatories as well. Uh, this is this plot on the left taken from Wikipedia just gives you a sense of scale for current and future optical observatories. X-ray observatories are a completely different animal. Um, I'll talk a little bit about X-ray observatories coming up, but uh, just to give you a sense of where the technology is evolving and how, how we get to the uh, point where we need to fly these things. Uh, so obviously it's a lot cheaper to build something on the ground and you can build a much larger observatory on the ground. So I believe the largest ground observatory right now is right here on the Canary Islands. The Keck telescopes are close. Um, and then there's a couple very large ones, including the 30 meter telescope uh, that's being planned. Uh, I think construction on that is, is imminent. Uh, the problem with that is the last slide alluded to is many of the photons you care about are absorbed by the atmosphere. And so uh, you can't make an X-ray observatory on the ground, or you can, but you won't really see much. Um, in the infrared, there are some atmospheric windows, but uh, broadly speaking, the atmosphere also absorbs infrared light. There's also just a lot of clutter there. Um, so you'd want to fly an infrared telescope like the James Webb that just launched. There's also this problem of, of turbulence. The reason that stars appear to twinkle, the stars aren't actually twinkling. That's the effect of the atmosphere. There are techniques to remove that twinkling. Uh, it's called adaptive optics that adds complexity to the telescopes. And, and the last thing, um, there's just relatively finite number of places to, to site an observatory uh, for good viewing. Uh, these tend to be uh, fairly high altitudes. So there's less of the atmospheric soup you need to look through and places that are very dry for the same reason. Um, the 30 meter telescope is kind of a, a good example of this uh, space, the space on the ground being contested. Um, so the construction there has been delayed because there, there's concerns from Hawaiians that, uh, you know, Mauna Kea is a, a sacred site and, you know, you're putting this giant observatory that's the size of a basketball court roughly on top there. And so uh, there's been a lot of pushback. And I think there's the alternate option is to put it, uh, I think it's the Canary Islands, um, but there is some controversy around that. So uh, you can also see from, these are, this uh, diagram depicts what the mirrors look like. So as the mirrors get larger, they're using these segmented mirrors um, and that hints at the complexity. So it's pretty hard to make one piece of glass the size of a basketball court, uh, you know, made to the standards needed for optical astronomy. So uh, people are instead making smaller segments, but then they need to be precision aligned. Um, and you actually see that with the James Webb Space Telescope on the, on the lower left here. So um, Webb would not have fit in any rockets if it weren't folded up. And so it needed this segmented design. Um, I will say that this increase in size is driven by science. Uh, generally, you wanna see dimmer things and you wanna see them at high resolution. So for example, uh, the resolution of an optical telescope is inversely proportional to the diameter of its primary mirror. Um, and then the last thing to bring us into kind of the, you know, the realm of possibility, I've seen a figure that estimates that the cost of a telescope goes as its uh, diameter to the 2.4 power. So these things uh, are not linearly expensive with size, they're, they're growing quite expensive um, because they're so complex. And, you know, Webb is kind of a notorious example. Um, you know, it's working beautifully as far as uh, everyone can tell at this point, um, but it was originally budgeted for something like a couple billion dollars. And I think it's all in cost now is something like $11 billion. And it launched, you know, many, many years um, behind schedule. All right, so I'm gonna talk now about some of the uh, detectors that we've built in observatories that are, I think, really, critically important and worth highlighting. And so I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. I was mainly talking about optical observatories there. I'm gonna talk about an X-ray observatory, uh, Chandra. 
So Chandra is one of NASA's great observatories. It was launched um, in 1999, in July of 99. Um, so it's nearly 23 years old. It's been taking scientific data for that much, almost that duration of time. And it's really, uh, I actually have a hard time sort of getting my head around how it's changed our view of the world because in 1999, you know, I was in my first year of graduate school. And I think a lot of, well, first of all, I'm not an astronomer, but a lot of the uh, understanding of how, you know, the, the cosmos is structured has been driven by Chandra. And it's, it, to me, at least it's been sort of internalized. And so I think rather than highlighting these, uh, you know, some of these advances shown on the right, I'll just say in general, I think you can probably divide astrophysics into before Chandra and after Chandra. It's been um, so important. If many of the ways that we think about the universe, for example, you know, that most of the matter in the universe is composed of the stuff called dark matter, that the core of most galaxies contains a black hole, that, you know, galaxies cluster and interact, uh, matter between the galaxies interacts, uh, that our Milky Way galaxy is surrounded by this diffuse halo of matter. These things uh, were observations that uh, Chandra made. These conclusions were driven by, largely by what Chandra did. Uh, so Lincoln provided the imagers, the CCDs for, for the Chandra telescope. Um, that's shown here on the upper left. Uh, so there's this two by two array. These are, these are imagers used for, for uh, sorry, these are for imaging, um, but also along the top here, there's a, a spectrograph. Um, so basically it's the X-ray equivalent of a prism. This X-ray grading disperses the X-rays along the spectrograph. And you can use that to very accurately measure the energy or we'll say the color of the X-rays. And that gives you information about the source of those X-rays. And uh, so Chandra, again, launched many years ago, but continues to make really important discoveries. So these are just two examples um, that I became aware of recently. Uh, so the first one, uh, Chandra found a, a black hole that uh, dates to the first, within the first billion years of the universe, uh, the formation of the universe. Uh, this particular black hole is called a cloak black hole. It's uh, basically, it wouldn't have been, you wouldn't be able to see it by other means because it's surrounded by this halo of matter that's absorbing radiation. Uh, and only the high energy X-rays got through. This particular observation, um, this discovery of this early black hole, uh, the observation was uh, three X-ray photons measured in a 16 hour observation. So this is a very, very faint object and hints at the, uh, you know, the challenge uh, of the requirements for scientific discovery. On the right here uh, is a recent discovery that Chandra made. I think this is still being verified, but evidence for an exoplanet. Well, uh, if you follow science, you know that we're finding exoplanets seemingly daily, but this is the only exoplanet we've found that's not in our galaxy. Uh, and this was done by looking at a, a basically a very bright and sharp, like a point source of X-rays and seeing that it was dimmed by something passing in front of it that was consistent with an exoplanet about the size, I think of Saturn. Uh, passing in front of that. So I, I think that's pretty neat. I'm going to talk about the next X-ray observatory uh, later in this talk. I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk now about an optical observatory called PanSTARS. So uh, the PanSTARS telescope is at uh, in Hawaii, and it is the uh, largest imager uh, astronomical imager to date. It's a 1.4 gigapixel array. Um, I think in the next year or two, there's a telescope in Chile, uh, the, uh, I think it's called the um, Rubin Observatory. Um, that one is going to be even larger, but we still hold the record uh, at this time. So the one of the scientists involved in this, John Tonry at the University of Hawaii is holding what we call the focal plane, the array of these detectors. Uh, there are 64 of them. And you can see this object is quite large. It's about 15 inches across. 
Um, what he's holding is essentially priceless. It's very difficult to build this. Uh, there's a lot that went into this. These actually, these devices really had every trick up our sleeve as well. Um, I won't go into all of that detail, but uh, this was an amazing, uh, amazing feat to pull off. And this is something that was done, you know, 15 years ago and is still state of the art. Uh, just to give you a sense of what PanStars uh, can do, this is a, a, a movie I'm going to show called The Medium Deep Field. I have the moon here for scale so you can kind of see the, the size of the field of view. I'm just going to run through this and you can just see the exquisite detail you get by having a gigapixel array. Um, I just call this the infinite zoom video where it just seems to go on and on. All right, uh, so with that in mind, I, I want to point out a fairly recent discovery you may have heard of that PanStars made. Uh, some of you may have heard of this uh, interstellar object, uh, Oumuamua, that was, was found. There was a lot of heated speculation about what it could be. Um, some of that speculation was rather fantastic. Um, I have found the... Uh, more uh, you know, boring, it's just a comet uh, explanation to probably be closer to the truth, at least from my outsider's perspective. But this object was uh, detected by, by PanStars. So one thing that PanStars does is looks for near-Earth objects. Um, PanStars might be one of the telescopes that saves the world someday by you know, detecting, uh, detecting an asteroid before it actually has the potential to impact um, in every sense of the word civilization. And so it was doing an observation and trying to fit uh, this object to a known orbit and it didn't make any sense. And they realized it's because it came from outside of the asteroid belt. And then so once they made that discovery, they basically sent out the bat signal of every other observatory and they started to look at Oumuamua. It was already on its way out of the uh, solar system at that point. Um, but uh, the other observatories were able to take more observations to lead to this artist's depiction where they, they know it's this oblong object that appeared to be tumbling chaotically. Um, they have no evidence that there's a comet plume, but the thinking, as far as I understand, is that um, there's essentially water that is uh, sort of trapped inside the body. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, of that object. And then the last uh, observatory I'll highlight here, sort of from the past, uh, fairly recent, is uh, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS. This is an exoplanet finder that launched, oh, now over four years ago. Um, this word here, photometric, uh, talk a little bit about that's precise measure of the, the amount of signal. Uh, you basically are, have a very sensitive light bucket. Um, and this is cataloging exoplanets that can then be uh, targeted for future observations by the James Webb Space Telescope. And uh, TESS is getting a known exoplanet discovery. So this is a verified discovery roughly every two weeks. Um, and its mission was originally two years, but was extended another five years. And as far as I know, the instrument is still uh, functioning flawlessly. Uh, TESS has four different cameras on it. Each of those cameras has four of our CCDs. So there's 16 total flying on TESS. And uh, TESS was a mission led by MIT in a very close collaboration with Lincoln Laboratory. So the way that this works is you're looking at the change in brightness of a star when an exoplanet passes in front of it. Um, that change in brightness is on the order of, I believe, 10 or so parts per million. So that is why precision is required. Um, but this is, this is a cartoon of what it looks like. This looks like a very easy observation to make. Uh, in reality, it's much more complex than that. 
So this is what the raw data stream for an exoplanet transit looks like. Um, I'll pause for a second and we can all play the game of, of spot the exoplanet transits. I'll give you a hint, there are four here. Um, this is, uh, by the way, while you stare at that and ponder, uh, this is for a planet that is Earth-like around a star that is sun-like with a orbital distance and a year that's roughly Earth-like. Okay, so those are so the transits. Are, the, are these real data? Yes, that's real data. So those are the transits. Of course, I still can't see them, but when the astronomers process the data, this is what it looks like in the end. And so there's, of course, a massive amount of work that needs to be done to take this uh, flood of information off of an observatory and turn it into a real astronomical observation. I, I like this particular chart because this is kind of, you know, peeking under the hood there um, of how data is, raw data is turned into something processed um, and into an actual observation. Okay, so I've talked a lot about our CCDs. Let me talk about how they actually work. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to talk about a general imager first, a pixel array um, in a semiconductor material. So I'm going to try to keep this uh, pretty high level. Um, for those of you who have some expertise in semiconductors, I'm probably oversimplifying things a little bit, but uh, I wanted to make this um, graspable for people who uh, don't have that background. So basically, a semiconductor is a material that has an energy gap that you have to overcome for an electron to be able to move about in the material to conduct electricity. And when light hits a semiconductor, if light has enough energy, uh, more than that gap, it can basically promote an electron. Um, and then that electron can eventually be collected by the imager and turned into a digital signal. So that's essentially how almost all digital imaging devices work. Um, by the way, I point out uh, it can excite an electron. So first of all, that the efficiency of that process is called quantum efficiency. Quantum efficiency is a very scary sounding term, but it, it's basically just accounting. It's how many uh, photons or particles of light come in uh, compared to how many electrons you get out. Uh, that number by definition can't be greater than one, but there's this exception here. So when the light gets sufficiently energetic, you can actually make more than one electron. And the number you make is uh, proportional to the energy there. So that's, that's a quirk that is exploited for X-ray observatories that I'll talk about later. Um, the cameras in all of our iPhones are looking at very bright scenes, right? So uh, you're able to have uh, less than pristine imagers. Um, because you just have plenty of signal. So the noise doesn't really matter very much. Uh, for scientific imagers, the requirements are extraordinarily demanding. I think this quote from Sarah Seeger sums it up the best. Photons are currency. They really, every photon matters. And so noise, any nuisance signal uh, needs to be minimized. So the two main sources of noise are dark noise. This is if obviously if no light is incident on the detector, what are you measuring? That is a product of the inherent properties of the semiconductor material. So I mentioned that there's an energy gap that must be overcome for electrons to move about freely, but it's not a, a perfectly binary process. It's not either there's no electrons or there's some. There's always a few floating around. Um, if you cool the detector, you can reduce that number um, to a number that is close to zero. Um, for example, there is a team in the Department of Energy that has had uh, dark signals that are on the order of a thousandth of an electron per pixel per day. Um, so that I would say rounds to zero, um, but those are extremely specialized detectors. Uh, the other thing though is you can get dark noise from defects in the material. So the semiconductor materials we work with are very close to perfect crystals. Uh, as close to perfection uh, that humankind has ever achieved, probably. Um, but they're not completely perfect. 
So for example, if you expect to have an atom on a, on a uh, what's called a lattice site in the material um, and it's missing, that's called a vacancy. That is a, a source of defects and ultimately a source of dark current. There's many other uh, defects that can occur. I like to say that there's really only one way to make a good scientific CCD and there's an infinite number of ways to make a bad one. Uh, over and over, I have found that things that do not appear to matter and thus end up biting us in the end. Uh, the other main source of noise is called read noise. So the, uh, the charge in each pixel, that's a, an analog uh, number, uh, needs to be converted to bits eventually, um, you know, to become a, a digital signal that can be you know, read by electronics. And so the read noise is also uh, a part of the noise penalty you have to pay. And, and much of what we do is to try to minimize uh, that noise as well. I will touch on that a little bit later. Okay, so that's, that's a very generalized pixel array. I have a little bit of a taxonomy here. Uh, this is very Lincoln-centric. This doesn't encompass every kind of uh, detector or imaging device, but I mean, it gets us some of the flavors we think about. So this middle uh, classification of devices, these are called active pixel sensors. They're also called CMOS imagers. This is the technology we have in our phones. So in every pixel, the light is converted in the charge and then amplified. That very faint signal is amplified. And uh, you know, this technology is obviously quite inexpensive. Uh, the bill of materials for an iPhone camera is a few hundred bucks. Uh, that is orders of magnitude cheaper than uh, what one of our CCDs runs for a scientific application. They're also quite small. Uh, I think an iPhone imager is on the order of a, a few millimeters on the side. You saw the picture of pan stars uh, some uh, number of slides back where we're talking about feet on the side for these focal planes. So it is just much more demanding to tile more of an area with these exquisitely sensitive scientific imagers. It's a harder problem, a different problem than what's done in industry. Um, because, because these are, are CMOS imagers, as the name implies, they're uh, inherently compatible with some of the processing techniques um, uh, that are in, used today in iPhone photography, right? You're, you have facial recognition, for example. Uh, um, amazing technologies built into these inexpensive cameras. So the downsides uh, are important for science. They're, they have less sensitivity. Remember, photons are currency. So if you're throwing away photons, that's bad. And then something that CCDs can do is they can move the charge around before it's digitized. And that turns out to be a really important feature for some classes of observations that simply cannot be done in an active pixel sensor. So a CCD, this is the original uh, digital imager. This is a technology that was developed uh, more than 40 years ago. Um, the idea here is that you've got a bank of capacitors, basically a two-dimensional array. Capacitor is just the charge storage element. And then you've got a small number of readouts. Uh, in the most primitive case, you have one readout. And so every pixel is read out in a serial fashion. So basically the pixels have to get in line to be converted to a digital signal. That is the best and worst part of a CCD. So basically, because they have to get in line through one amplifier, that one amplifier is very uniform. So it's a very easy instrument to calibrate. It's got very uniform response across the array because it's all going through the same output. Um, the downside of that is that serial amplification means these devices are relatively slow. So a CCD, uh, a fast framing CCD would be on the order of one frame per second. Um, and there are some specialized designs that could go much faster, but for astronomy, that's, that's considered pretty fast. Also, because you've got uh, this serialized readout, um, you have to move charge uh, a long way. So in this detector here, this is um, five centimeters on the side. And so if there's one readout here, let's say it's at the, the lower left end of this device and you want to read out charge here, you've got to traverse centimeters of silicon. And that makes you very susceptible to radiation damage, which is important for space-based sensors. Uh, things that are in space are awash in, in radiation. Um, 
from the sun and from cosmic uh, sources outside of the solar system. And those can interrupt the uh, perfection of these devices. The other downside of CCDs is they require this, you know, custom high voltage electronics for the cameras. Um, you know, it's, they're much more bulky cameras than you see in a cell phone. Uh, our CCD cameras are, you know, roughly the size of typically, um, you know, the size of like a pitcher, uh, two quart, uh, sorry, two liter pitcher sort of thing. And in another class of detectors, um, these things called avalanche photodiodes. I, I included this because these are, these are a specialized detector that are becoming more relevant now that self-driving cars are, you know, on the horizon. So this is actually one of the core components for, for LADAR. Um, so these are detectors that are basically a specialized semiconductor device where they're quivering, uh, basically waiting to be hit by a photon of light. And when they do that, it sets off this chain reaction that generates a massive signal. Um, and these are, these are very fast detectors compared to uh, CCDs. Um, even though they're single photon sensitive, they're not, they don't detect 100% of those photons coming in. Uh, so that's a downside. Again, you're throwing away you know, more than half of the photons. Um, so that's a problem for astronomy. And then uh, these are hard to make in the large devices partly because of this issue of optical crosstalk. So when this thing fires, when a pixel fires, uh, it emits light that can trigger adjacent pixels. So you can get this, these uh, nuisance crosstalk signals that are very difficult to manage. Uh, we develop, we focus in our group on these sort of outer, uh, outer types of uh, detector technologies, leaving the active pixel sensors largely to industry, though we do dabble in that for some applications that are not being addressed by commercial vendors. OK, a little more detail on CCD operation before I uh, talk through these bullets, um, which really uh, just uh, outline the animation. Let me get the animation going. I hope this works. Yep, it looks like it's working. So the way a CCD works is uh, each of these pixels converts light into electrons. Um, so the number of electrons depends on the intensity during the imaging operation. The electrons are then transferred down in this particular device into a frame store region. Uh, I'll let this play through again, but that's an operation that's done pretty quickly. So it's, it's a shuttered device um, because you have this essentially this connect four type operation where the electrons fill down. And then there's that serial readout you can see. So we go, uh, row by row and then column by column through the readout amplifier. This particular architecture called frame transfer is al almost all of our CCDs use this architecture. There are other variants of this, um, but this is the this is our tried and true method. Um, I will point out, I mentioned this before, you have to move charge between centimeters of silicon in large devices megapixel class devices, you're transferring that charge thousands of times. So a critical metric for CCDs is charge transfer efficiency. Basically, it's to do the accounting of the number of electrons. Uh, if you get 1,000 electrons in this pixel, you read out and measure 1,000 electrons on the end. You don't lose them in transfers. And it, it's very imp important to have this as high as possible for a couple reasons. One, if you're trying to measure the color, for x-ray applications to measure the energy. You don't want to mischaracterize that. Um, and then the second is, if you have poor charge transfer efficiency on an optical image, you'll see smearing. Uh, the CCDs that we build are built on site in our microelectronics laboratory. So this is a really unique resource for the government. It's a, a 90 nanometer node production class set of semiconductor processing tools. 90 nanometers is not state of the art. Uh, the CMOS, uh, the Intels of the world are you know, at volume now at 14 nanometer devices, but this is for the government, a very advanced capability. We can print smaller features than 90 nanometers, and we're also looking into upgrading from 90 to 45 nanometers. Uh, this facility actually is what's called a DOD trusted foundry. So we can, we can build uh, devices 
uh, that are the design is completely classified. We actually, as part of that, getting that certification, we had to be ISO certified. So we have a quality quality management system. Uh, we So we actually have a dedicated staff of uh, engineers and technicians uh, responsible for running material through this facility, maintaining the basic processes and maintaining the equipment. And it, it spans, I think, this very important space in the ecosystem of uh, developing devices for the government. This is depicted here. This is a sort of a plot of process maturity versus innovation. So on the lower right here, you've got sort of the wild west of the university clean room. You can do whatever you want. There's no guarantee that if you do the same thing twice, you'll get the same result because the equipment is archaic and people are basically allowed to do whatever they want in there. Um, so um, not as capable, but you know, you're able to really try out some crazy ideas. And on the upper left here, you've got the commercial foundries, the Intel TSMCs of the world. These are places that do not like to introduce new processes. Their advantage is massive scale and volume. Um, so we sit in this vast middle space. We can take a technology developed in a university and scale it up to the point where we can you know, deliver into actual fielded systems. And I would say there's not many places in the world that span this range. So uh, that's why I think uh, Lincoln has this great capability. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we build a CCD. Uh, the core of the CCD, again, it's a, it's a bank of capacitors for storing and that charge and passing it out to the readout. This is a cartoon of what those capacitors look like. So a capacitor is an insulating or dielectric material uh, sandwiched between two electrodes or conductors. In our case, our electrodes are silicon and polysilicon. Uh, they are semiconductors, but they're conductive enough uh, compared to the uh, insulating material, which is a bilayer of silicon dioxide and silicon nitride. And each of these capacitors uh, is formed by patterning polysilicon layers. So we actually, in most of our CCDs, we have three overlapping polysilicon layers that are deposited. So we deposit the first one, pattern it, deposit and pattern a second one, and then a third. And the overlap here ensures good charge transfer efficiency between these uh, different phases of a pixel. Um, the reason that there's three layers of polysilicon is there's three phases in a pixel. There's basically a collecting phase and then two barriers to confine the charge within the pixel. And so each pixel actually contains three individual capacitor elements. So a slightly more complex version of the, the cartoons that we showed there. What's really important in a CCD, the, the real challenge in scaling these devices to large arrays is preventing these capacitors from being electrically shorted to each other. So if your polysilicon films have a bridging short, that is a, a layer of conductive material that connects them, let's say there's a little flake of metal that got on there, or the, the silicon had a little uh, spike or asperity, uh, the polysilicon, I should say, or there was a particle uh, you know, that you know, everything landed on and fouled up your patterning. Uh, a short is a disaster for a CCD. They are not tolerant to shorts, basically. Uh, at best, it will be a blemish that will make the device a, uh, we'll say a B-grade device, but at worst, it basically renders it inoperable. Again, this gets down to that, the best and worst part of CCDs is that serial readout. So if you have a blemish in the work, the, the wrong spot, every single pixel has to go through that blemish. Now, this cartoon looks pretty simple. Right, uh, a few layers of polysilicon, some insulators between them. Uh, no big deal, right? Well, this is what a CCD actually looks like if you look at it in an optical microscope. Uh, this is an output region, so a corner of a particular device. This this particular array was designed for a uh, application for NASA. If you can see my mouse pointer, the scale of the pixel. I'm outlining it here. Um, you're probably seeing something on the order of in this region, maybe uh, you know five by let's say ten pixels. That's the the very corner of a this imaging array, which happens to be a two megapixel uh, device. 
each of these lateral stripes you see in this region and the vertical stripes in this region are polysilicon layers. So the, the pink, the sort of uh, yellow tan and the green. Those are those overlapping polysilicon layers separated by insulator. So we're looking now top down uh, rather than uh, side view as shown on the left. Obviously there's a lot of other detail here. I can just walk through that a little bit. So these vertical stripes you see, um, these are called channel stops. So these provide column isolation in the device. The reason you see this is there's actually insulators uh, here to prevent the charge from dribbling into the nearby columns as well. Uh, that's a, a very specialized and, and tricky process that we have to implement. This uh, sort of medium brown color and this reddish color, these are two layers of metal routing. The brown is at the top. Um, in, and then sort of over the polysilicon, but under this dark brown, these red stripes are another layer of metal routing. Most of our CCDs need these two levels of routing to move signals from where you're actually uh, sending the voltage inputs into the device to operate it uh, and distributing that across it. The reason very simply why you need two layers of metal is because you have crossing metal lines. So you need to have different tiers so they don't connect to each other. Uh, those are connected with vias. Uh, you can kind of see them here a little bit. Uh, so this case, a via connects this, this bar to this uh, piece of metal. Um, and then uh, there's an output amplifier here. This is a, a transistor that basically we dump the charge into to change the operating point of that transistor. That's essentially how the output circuit works. And then there's a lot of other details here that are just basically fabrication tricks. Um, we have these, uh, these capacitors to prevent these very sensitive, uh, large capacitors to prevent these small capacitors from getting blown up during processing. And we've got a lot of detail here. This is called fill. Uh, we wanna have a fairly uniform density of metal during processing to get uh, very uniform uh, planar surfaces when we're, we're building these multi-layer stacks. So to give you a sense of uh, complexity here, uh, to build this particular device requires about four to 500 process steps. Uh, there's about 15 individual layers in this device. Most of them are invisible. They are layers interior to the silicon that define the electric fields inside the semiconductor. So you're only seeing maybe a half dozen of those uh, layers that are explicitly visible as uh, circuitry or polysilicon. Um, and it takes us about six months to build this device. Um, but as uh, Paul Harvey used to say, there's the rest of the story. So that gives us a device that can do imaging, but it doesn't give us a scientific device. And the reason for that is uh, all of that circuitry obscures the pixels from collecting the light. Uh, I had a professor once say this about solar cells. If you can see it, it's not absorbing light, right? So all of this stuff here, that is reflected light. That's not getting into the pixels. So uh, you can also see that here, all that stuff is just reflected light. Um, so the polysilicon and the metal uh, is a problem. So we need to do what's called back illuminating this device. So after six months of fabrication, where we've got a device that has some sensitivity and can operate as an imager, we need to make it collect almost 100% of the photons coming in. So the way we do that is we take this perfect and very expensive uh, wafer, uh, we flip it over and we bond it to a dummy wafer or what we call a handle wafer. We thin the detector. Uh, the, the reason it's, it's made thin is to give us better uh, uh, lateral resolution, uh, basically. The wafer that you see here is about 725 microns thick, just shy of a, um, for those who don't think of microns, just shy of a millimeter. Uh, so fairly thick and we will absorb, or sorry, remove somewhere between uh, maybe 75 or 65% to about 97% of that material. We have to do that uniformly over an entire uh, eight inch diameter wafer. We have our methods to do that. After we do that, uh, we put down an anti-reflective coating, something called passivation. Uh, any dangling bonds at this back surface is a source of dark noise. The passivation ties up those bonds. The anti-reflective coating 
gives us higher quantum efficiency. So we collect more light basically. And then now all of that circuitry has been buried at this bond interface, right? We glued the wafer down to some handle and we can't connect it to the outside world without cutting through on the edge of the device. We cut through all of that silicon and we expose the buried metal underneath. So this process of back illumination is used for virtually every scientific CCD. It adds another few months to device fabrication, um, but is absolutely required. The device you're seeing here, so this is the front illuminated version of the same wafer. So each of these, uh, this, what I'm outlining here is an individual CCD. The black region is the imaging array. You may remember I was talking about frame transfer devices. This is where we're doing the imaging. The frame store region is covered in aluminum. We don't wanna get light in that region. We wanna use it just to allow us to leisurely read out the CCD. So it's covered with an opaque material we call a light shield. And then each of the CCDs is separated by streets. This allows you to dice the wafer. And typically in those street regions, we'll have test structures that we can uh, use to diagnose uh, the health of the processing and try to debug anything that may have gone wrong. Okay, so let me talk a little bit more about photon absorption and silicon. Uh, the banner here really says it all. Silicon is this exquisitely versatile material where we can image photons spanning four orders of magnitude of wavelength or energy range. Uh, that's illustrated here. So this is a plot of the absorption depth. This is the, the absorption depth is a figure of merit that describes roughly when two thirds of the photons are absorbed. Um, it's, uh, it's a little detail, but it, uh, the, the absorption is exponentially sensitive to thickness. So it's actually related to E, the number E. Uh, it's the one over E absorption depth, if you're really into that, um, versus photon energy, or here you can see kind of color on the upper axis. Here's that, again, that very small sliver that our eyes operate in, the visible range. Um, and the span of range of interest here we're talking about, again, is many orders of magnitude. So uh, for silicon detectors, sometimes the photons are just uh, not energetic enough to promote an electron across that energy gap. Those are low energy photons or colloquially uh, infrared photons, right? And so a silicon detector is, is transparent to these energies because its energy gap is too high. So we need to use a different material here uh, these are the, this is the domain typically of what's called compound semiconductors, um, materials like indium gallium arsenide, for example, or in the James Webb Space Telescope, mercury cadmium telluride. The very name implies more complexity, right? These are alloys of, or of different materials. They're much more difficult to process. Uh, if silicon can detect it, it's going to win the battle every time because this is the basis of all modern microelectronics. So on the right-hand side here, uh, this is in the high energy X-ray band, what we call hard X-rays. In this case, the X-rays are simply too energetic to be absorbed. And so this span of white here, this is the wavelength range that silicon can detect. Again, about four uh, orders of magnitude of energy or wavelength. And I mentioned this uh, really great uh, quirk of nature before, I'll just highlight it again here. So for energetic photons, photons that uh, are ultraviolet or beyond, you generate more than one electron in silicon each time a photon is absorbed. And thankfully that process is linear with energy um, and fairly deterministic as I'll talk about in the next slide. So you can characterize the, the color of light by counting the number of electrons you generate in the material. Now that of course assumes you have a scene that doesn't have that many photons, right? If while you're imaging, you get three photons in a pixel, you're gonna have this jumble of confusion. So this is something that's very handy for scenes that don't have a lot of photons. And on average, you have far less than one photon per pixel. Here's an example of what you can do with that. Uh, spectroscopy, again, characterizing the energy or color of X-rays. So when an X-ray is absorbed in silicon, you generate a, a, a cloud of electrons uh, that the size of that cloud is generally smaller than the pixel size, but kind of comparable to the pixel size. And then you can, you can just basically count the number of electrons you have. 
and you can build up this uh, histogram of counts versus energy. So this is this is analog to digital units. This is the raw, you know, bitstream coming off the CCD. But I've put the energy scale here. So this is in keV. Uh, optical photons are uh, much lower energy than this. But you can see these peaks that are characteristic of different sources. They do have a finite width. That's because this process of generating the charge cloud isn't completely deterministic. There's an inherent noise or variation in that. It depends on the noise in the detector and, and on the basic material properties. But what we really care about is getting these peaks as sharp as possible so you can discriminate sources that are very close in energy. Uh, so another really cool thing, a little bit into the weeds here, but something I find fascinating about this is because we know on average how many X-rays are generated, I'm sorry, how many electrons are generated for a given X-ray, we can use that to absolutely calibrate a detector. So the tried and true method is this iron 55 source that generates 1,620 electrons, you know, uh, give or take with this line width. And so we can illuminate a CCD with uh, an iron 55 source. And then we can use that to, to figure out what the ultimate gain, which can vary from output to output is. So we can calibrate the outputs and you know have this very uniform looking detector on the end. Because we know that on the end, however many digital units there are that corresponds to 1,620 electrons. Uh, the other thing that I'll point out uh, that turns out to be uh, rather challenging is for those times when that charge cloud lands between pixels, that's called a split event. And that's another uh, advantage of a CCD. So in a, uh, an active pixel sensor, when you have a split event and you want to figure out, you want to assign that, figure out if it was that two x-rays that happened to hit at roughly the same time at adjacent pixels, that are lower energy, or is it one higher energy X-ray? In other words, you know, is it two bins of 500 electrons or one bin of 1,000? If you want to do that on an active pixel sensor, you have to pay a noise penalty to do that. But in a CCD, you don't have to do that. You can do what's called pixel binning. You can do that for free. You don't have to pay a noise penalty. And so you, you can actually change the size of your pixels on the fly to figure that out. Um, so that's a really neat capability. OK, so uh, with that out of the way, I want to talk a little bit on the remaining time I have about future directions. Um, so uh, the first is we want to build CCDs that operate more like uh, these active pixel sensors. They take the best features of both devices. So to do that, we want to make CCDs operate at low voltage so they're compatible with uh, CMOS uh, electronics rather than these custom power supplies we have to provide. We want to reduce the noise of these uh, readout amplifiers so we can detect even fainter signals. And we want to put the whole thing together so it's, it's photons in and bits out on the other end, basically plug this in, and um, you don't have to have this complex electronics behind it. And the motivation for this is a, a future X-ray observatory. This is one concept that was considered called LINX. Uh, so I won't go into the LINX concept in the interest of time in great detail, but a couple of these instruments are bookmarked to fly CCDs, these uh, HDXI and XGS. Um, and so to give you a sense of the quantum leaps required compared to Chandra, which we flew 23 years ago in LINX, we need to have uh, 16 times the number of pixels, we need to have even better energy resolution, so lower noise, we need to operate this device 300 times faster. Uh, we need to do it in pixels that are even smaller. And so the, this problem of split events becomes even more acute. And then uh, lastly, on the CCD side, I'm sorry, I lost my focus there. All right, yeah, we're back. So everything I've talked about today is silicon, but we're working on building CCDs on germanium. I mentioned that the infrared is more or less now exclusively the domain of these compound semiconductors like indium gallium arsenide. Germanium is a, a group four semiconductor on the periodic table. It's downstairs from silicon by one row. It can be processed in the same tools used to build silicon detectors. Uh, if only it were that easy, but this is an example of a Lincoln hard problem where we want to build CCDs on germanium. 
Uh, this is the motivation. So this is the quantum efficiency or sensitivity versus wavelength. I mentioned silicon is only sensitive mainly to the visible, pushing slightly into the infrared. Whereas germanium, you can see, spans a much broader range of, of uh, energies, pushing into what's called the shortwave infrared or sphere band. And then in, for x-rays, a similar story. So germanium can see deeper into the x-ray band and actually push the sensitivity into the gamma ray band. Um, so there's some really interesting science that can be done there. So basically, we want to say that everything that can be done in a silicon CCD can be done in germanium. Um, but you can hoover up even more photons, either, either in the infrared or the X-ray band. The price you have to pay for this is germanium has to run colder. So a scientific silicon detector would be running at something like minus 50 to minus 100 degrees C. Germanium will have to run at something like minus 150 to minus 200 C to obtain similar noise performance. So you're gonna to need to have cryogenic cooling. Um, so you'll have to pay an energy penalty for that in space, a complexity penalty. But we've been working on this for a very long time. I won't go into great detail here, but we started with humble little dinky wafers and very large devices, and we've steadily improved our complexity. Uh, we've made working pixel arrays. This is uh, one example. We've made larger arrays than this, but it's just a pretty picture of a, a little uh, pixel array that's less than a millimeter on the side. Uh, we've built up quite a bit of uh, electronics testing capability. This is an example. This is a cryostat. So this is a, a, a fixture where we can package an individual detector, put it in this cold vessel that's cooled by liquid nitrogen that has all these feed throughs to connect all of the signals of the CCD to the electronics that run it. And here's just that 32 by 32 pixel array. That's why it's so pixelated. There's only a, a thousand pixels or so. Uh, imaging a particular target here. This is a uh, a target uh, that has a uh, a three in it. We can't quite get the whole three. Um, so we're now scaling this to larger devices. We have NASA grants that started with internal R and D money, and uh, it's grown to several million dollars of external funding. I'm actually going to end with some reflections on that. You know, going back to this, like many of you are going, oh my God, like they've been working on this forever. Um, and yeah, we've been working on this forever, <laughs> um, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that later. Okay, I'm gonna end with a couple slides on something completely out of left field, but I just think it's super cool. And this is an example where we're trying to disrupt ourselves. We're trying to put CCDs out of business in some way. And this is by building detectors, not based on semiconductors, but by uh, building them on superconductors. And the particular instrument we have in mind is this Lynx X-ray microcalorimeter. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about that. So I mentioned that a CCD can measure the energy of an X-ray as well as image it at the same time. That's pretty cool. We can measure that in the resolving power, which is basically its ability to discriminate energy, uh, the full width half max of that peak compared to the energy that the X-ray photon has. Uh, the resolving power is on the order of say 20 or so for Chandra. And for our, our CCDs, we want to build for links. This is just inherent to the semiconductor material. We can't get around that. That's the law of nature. If we build a spectrometer like Chandra has, so instead of relying on counting electrons in the pixel, um, we disperse the x-rays uh, using, again, something like a prism for x-rays. We can have much higher resolving power, but it's, it's essentially a single element. We're not imaging now. We're doing. Uh, we have a spectrometer instead. So these are sort of orthogonal uh, goals. Uh, these uh, superconducting detectors, what they're called microcalorimeters, can do both. And so the object behind one of those instruments and links is to have 100,000 pixel elements. So you know we're not, we're not at the 100 megapixel level, but we're getting there. Um, but be able to have a very good resolving power. So it's really the best of both worlds. And the way this works is each of those pixels is a thermometer. It's a thermometer cooled to 50 millikelvin or so. And you're holding it at the transition point between what's called normal conducting and superconducting. So it's in this range where there is a finite resistance and the resistance is extremely sensitive to changes in temperature. When an X-ray photon hits um, the pixel, it changes the temperature. In some cases it changes it by fractions of a millikelvin. 
we're talking extremely small temperature changes, but these are really sensitive thermometers. This is what that microcalorimeter looks like in, in the basic design detail. So uh, to give you a sense, a CCD has an, a delta E, this energy resolving power of you know, typically on the order of 70 EV. So these are much more, uh, much better resolving power. And there's a few different flavors of uh, um, uh, arrays here. There's this main large array and then these ultra high resolution regions. So this was uh, envisaged for links uh, at the time. It was uh, the state of the art uh, microcalorimeter had 36 pixels. And the goal of links was to take it up to 100,000. So obviously a massive leap. Um, and to my knowledge, there was really no way to do that. Uh, we had this serendipitous thing happen. Um, a lot of people at Lincoln are reformed astrophysicists. They went to grad school for astrophysics. They come to Lincoln. They work on national security problems, including my former boss. And he had friends at NASA, and he was interested in this stuff. And he said, what's limiting you guys from getting to uh, very large arrays? We thought it was building those thermometers, but it turns out it was something a little more boring than that, but still important, was wiring wiring out those 100,000 little thermometers to the readout. All that wiring has to be superconducting. And they simply didn't have the fabrication capability. Well, thank thankfully we did. We, by complete accident, have developed a superconducting electronics process for other applications entirely. But it turns out this was one of those rare cases of you know peanut butter and chocolate together just worked instantaneously. And so we basically said, oh, we could do that. And the first time we tried it, it worked perfectly. And so I'm going to say within like 18 months, uh, we went from 36 pixels to about 50,000 pixels. Um, and the pixels worked perfectly. So uh, we're, we didn't ruin their energy resolution by introducing wiring that might have uh, fouled that up. Um, and this particular array, there were so many pixels, they, could, they couldn't actually read them out. They had all the connections, but they didn't have enough bond pads, these are connections to the external world. Um, so this was a good proof of concept though. And then we're able to get a NASA grant and then finally build something that has all of those bond pads. So this has all the bells and whistles needed for a, a link sized 100,000 pixel array. This is an eight inch or 200 millimeter diameter wafer. And this array takes up nearly the, the, the entire wafer. And this is all of that wiring and the bond pads, et cetera. So this is now being integrated at uh, GSFC Goddard Space Flight Center. These are the people who build the thermometers. And uh, within a few short years, uh, we've taken this technology now to the point where it can fly uh, and do some really cool science. Uh, so just summarize, uh, I think you know Lincoln's a great place to work. We've done a, a lot of amazing work over the years, uh, particularly in CCDs. I talked about how flexible they are and some of our future developments, including uh, X-ray detectors for links that are semiconductor and superconductor. And I'm just gonna conclude uh, before we, we head to questions with just a, one slide of personal thoughts uh, in my, whatever wisdom I've accumulated in my 10 years here. Um, so, you know, I mentioned this early uh, about the team at Lincoln. I think it's great too, that I work at a place that is not pure R&D, that this stuff finds its place into the outside world you know, I didn't talk about the national security applications, but I would say that we've had comparable impact in national security. You know, we can obviously talk about the science. Um, but one of the things that, you know, I realized it took me a little while to fully grok this, you know, many of the frontiers of science are driven by advances in instrumentation, right? If you don't have that telescope, you can't make the observation. And so behind every Nobel Prize winning discovery like that, you know, there's an army of engineers that made that happen. Uh, I'm really humbled to be part of that army. You know, I think that's great. Um, and I, I think the culture here is that we love enabling that stuff. Um, and, you know, that's, that's the reason many of us are excited to come to work and we, why we take our work home in many cases. I'll also say um, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, one of my dear friends and colleagues uh, Barry Burke, uh, he, he started working on CCDs more or less soon after they were invented. 
he passed away last fall. I mean, I still think about him all the time. And, uh, you know, he was one of my role models for how you go about uh, your career here, you know, about the sort of having the humility and the open mindedness and the teamwork. Um, and I think the things that make Lincoln great are, are because of the people. And so I, I have, as, as a group leader, part of my job is to think strategically, it's to develop people, you know, all management, performance appraisals, balancing the books, all that stuff, right? But it's also to be a steward, right? To not break what makes this place great. And I think that's unique. I, I don't think that there's a lot of CEOs. I mean, maybe Tim Cook thinks that, I'm not sure. But, you know, that's how I think about my role. And in fact, that's one of the top parts is, is to maintain that culture of excellence that we have. And then I, I alluded to this earlier, the timelines. Um, it takes a really long time to build this stuff. To take a concept from its infancy and to get it on, a, on an observatory, particularly a space observatory, is 20 or 30 years. In fact, there was recent, this isn't me, there was a talk given at a recent conference I was at uh, one of the uh, plenary, you know, the highlight talks was talking about that long, strange road that technology traverses to get into scientific observatories. And when I heard someone else saying that, it made me feel so much better. Um, I am, uh, I'm a, a long distance runner. That's one of my hobbies. And, uh, you know, I always tell myself, like, you, you accrue the benefits of training by taking a step at a time. And those, you know, hundreds of thousands of steps you take pay dividends, uh, finally in a race that's months or years out. And it's the same way in this stuff. And you have to have a marathoner's mentality. You just keep putting one foot in front of the other through thick and thin. You have to be a true believer. You have to be irrational to work on this stuff. There, the money doesn't fall out of trees. You've got to go and hustle for it. And, you know, if you don't believe in it and if you don't care about it, no one else is just going to hand you the money. So you've got to really work hard at that. Um, and, you know, my vision of what I care about, this may sound hokey, but, you know, I think about things like links, right? I think about observatories launching in 2040. I, I will be in my 60s at that point. And, you know, I, I have this dream that I'll be bouncing my grandkids on my lap and saying, like, I played a little part in that. And, you know, some part of that wouldn't have happened if I wasn't part of that. So, you know, that is also about, I just end with this personal note. Um, you know, I think about what I want my legacy to be. You know, obviously I have my family, but my professional legacy, right? So that's defined by the people that work around me, right? I don't wanna be remembered as a jerk. I wanna be remembered like Barry, right? Um, but also that legacy can even transcend my lifetime, right? If I can help build an observatory that someday is making observations that um, are in a science textbook 100 years from now. Like, I think that's pretty cool. And so, sure, it's great to build a widget that, you know, people can buy off of Amazon, but I think there's something profound in that. It's almost a, you know, a transcendent mission to think about building something that outlasts you. And so I'm really energized to be part of that. And that's what gets me here every day. All right, I'm going to stop talking. I've talked a very long time. I think we do have a little more time for questions. So thank you all for your patience. Um, I'll take any questions now. So uh, there was one question which is sort of related in the uh, uh, to what you're talking about. Uh, Steve asked, how do you know the age of a black hole? How can you determine the age of a black hole? Oh, you got me. No, uh, so my understanding of this is about an inch deep, but it has to do with the redshift. Um, you know, everything is moving away from us. And so you're looking at the, the redshift of photons. Um, that's basically all, all I can say about that, though, in any great detail. Uh, as, as Rich alluded to, I'm a material scientist by training, not an astronomer. I just, I just play one occasionally, or I, I tout their discoveries. There we go. Fair enough. And, and as you said that, I think we've talked about that a little bit before in some, some other sessions. We've, we've talked about measuring uh, age using redshift. And that, and that sort of stuff. Dick? I had to un unmute myself. Um, a couple of things. One is, I was wondering about historical um, 
use of CCDs. Um, when did they start to be used? I was in the late 1970s. I was trying to do something where I was trying to get uh, microscopic um, pictures and I was using different colors. So I had to have a spectroscopic kind of a, of a device and also see something at very small scales. And uh, we were reading, of course, literature and the CCD concept came across our minds at that time. Was that about the time when CCDs started to be developed? That is correct. So it's a, it's a pretty old technology. Um, their heyday uh, was probably the 90s. Um, the active pixel sensor uh, was developed by this uh, gentleman at, I think at the time he was at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He's now actually faculty at Dartmouth. Um, and that spelled the end of, of CCDs for commercial applications. So they still fill a very important niche for scientific uh, applications and for some national security, but their heyday was largely the 90s. Um, to give you a sense, I believe the first, the first CCD ever flown for an astrophysics mission was actually a Lincoln CCD. Um, and I believe that was flown in 1995. The CCDs were invented at at and Bell Labs in the 60s. Um, it's for Charleston. Uh, I was working there at the time and a fellow named George Smith uh, invented the imager application for the CCDs. Uh, another historical point is that Barry Burke graduated from Stanford as a plasma physicist and all of his CCD work eventually enabled all of these telescopes to observe the wide bandwidth uh, astrophysics uh, phenomenon. So, so in a way, Barry was, was a gift to his old discipline of astrophysics. It's sort of amazing that over close to 50 years at Lincoln Laboratory, he worked primarily on improving imagers for astrophysical observations. Yes, and, and he was doing great work until the very end. Yes, yes, he was. He had cancer, he was extremely sick and he couldn't wait to come in. That's right, that's right. He, unfortunately, he, he had cancer for a long time and a new therapy at Leahy last fall did not go well. Yeah, another point about the history, the CCD was invented to be a memory device actually. Originally, yes. Yeah. Talk about serendipity. Wow. They, uh, they got a Nobel Prize for it, too. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, minor, uh, minor point. <laughs> a second question I have is, is there a trade-off between uh, spectroscopic resolution and the actual imaging itself? In other words, spatial resolution? Um, not at the... So for x-rays, not at the... Uh, pixel scales that uh, we talk about. If the pixels got really small, it would be very difficult because you'd have all of these split events. You'd, you know, you'd have charge now split between eight pixels instead of two or something like that. Um, uh, but the pixel pitch is actually limited by the ability to make high resolution X-ray optics. So we can make much finer pitch imagers than uh, are required for that. But in a sense, having uh, big pixels just makes your life easier for that reason. Another historical perspective on uh, the long road to, to improving technology. Um, I started the superconducting effort at Lincoln Laboratory over 30 years ago. Wow, and, I didn't know that. Yeah, and it, um, it went through a couple of uh, episodes. One was, um, the use of passive superconductors for RF uh, signal processing. And then it evolved into doing uh, superconducting digital logic. And for that, we needed high resolution. So we migrated with the help of IBM, a uh, silicon compatible process into the same fabrication lab where the CCDs are made. So along comes someone like Chris, and he has a fab capability that spans everything from superconductors to CCDs. And so the integration 
of that high density wiring comes, comes along sort of naturally for him, but it was 30 years in development before, before he needed it. And that's, that's again, the benefit of, of MIT Lincoln Laboratory taking the, the long view. Yeah, something else I'll point out. Uh, I probably sound like a laboratory exceptionalist, um, but I think a lot of other places are so siloed that I don't know that you'd get that collaboration. Um, there are probably a lot of other places that have this not my job mentality or you know, you're gonna take my business away. Uh, that's not how we work here. We don't, you know, um, we have very few institutional barriers to collaborating inside the lab. And so, uh, like I mentioned, you know, maybe in 30 years, we put ourselves out of business for CCDs, but it's for a better cause. Yeah, the, the hybridization of different disciplines works extremely well at Lincoln Laboratory. That's, that's where it's those intersections of, of different disciplines and different technologies that, that drives a lot of the applications that, that we end up implementing. That sounds very similar to what I, what I read about Bell Labs. That was part of their, their the beauty at Bell Labs historically as well. When I, when I worked at AT&T Bell Laboratories, I agree. When it became Lucent, um, well, it, was no longer, it was no longer a national treasure. Right. No, understood. Bell Laboratories was a, was a treasure for a long time, and then it did change. Yeah. As you show some uh, uh, beautifully crafted materials, uh, with, even at the macro level, with, with great um, you know, appearing metallurgy, well, where is that done physically? I'm sorry, the, uh, what do you mean specifically? When you show the equipment, it's very precise. It's not like a rough, like you work in a regular lab at a, at a university. You're using all the junky equipment. The, the, the stuff you show is so beautifully constructed. The, the metallurgy is very sophisticated, even for just products you, you, you're experimenting with, not that you're putting out on the, into, into the real world. Where is that done physically? The, the, that takes great skill, that, that alone. It's, it's off Wood Street in Lexington. Yep. You can see the building that he showed a picture of, if you drive down the yeah. corner of Wood Street and Hartwell Avenue near the Anscombe Air Force Base, it's there. And we're building a new lab uh, that's going to be even bigger that's going to do three, five. Uh, so that's all done, uh, inter it's all done yep. internally. Yep. Yes. So wow. the, uh, the tool set there is it's all commercial uh, you know, equipment that is used in commercial fabrication facilities. Um, just uh, we do not have the budget to buy all that stuff new. Um, so we uh, we have bought lots of used equipment uh, and, you know, rehabilitated it. Um, and, uh, you know, in some cases, we actually bought parts off of eBay. But, uh, yeah, it's I think it's actually a testament to the the engineers that keep the stuff up and running well, uh, too. You know, you mentioned that metallurgy, uh, you know, those precise looking lines, not rough. Uh, that actually, weirdly enough, turns out to be important. So that roughness can actually, you know, lead to shorts between dense uh, arrays of metal lines. So it's it's not just a cosmetic feature, uh, you know, eliminating things like hillix and rough edges of a of an etched uh, metal line can actually be really important. There are many steps where the wafer is replanarized by polishing it to get all the layers smooth, so it can build up many stacks of uh, wiring. That's part of the process. And, and one of the benefits of buying used equipment comes from not being at 14 nanometer technology node. We're at, we're at 90, hoping to go to 45. So, so we trail the digital technology, but our resolution is very good for analog CCD devices and superconducting devices. I, what, I lost track a little bit, but I think Harry's up next. Thanks. Um, a question I have relates to who are your competitors? Are there any in the U.S. or are there any in the world? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. So first, I want to point out who isn't our competitor, which is largely industry. So uh, we essentially are not allowed to compete with industry. Uh, not essentially. We do not compete with industry. Um, so if you could buy these, uh, we would stop making them. Um, our competitors are, there's some overlap i say that there is a commercial 
limited commercial base for CCDs. There's a company, Teledyne. Um, Teledyne uh, essentially is the only uh, the only manufacturer of CCDs in the commercial space today, because essentially it's all been replaced by CMOS imagers. Uh, there used to be a, a place called Dalsa, a company called Dalsa in Quebec that would build them as a foundry service. So you would, you know, you'd send them the the plans and the the process they want to run, and they build CCDs. And they built them for uh, Department of Energy Labs. Teledyne bought Dalsa and then shut down the CCD line. And those DOE labs are left without a place to build anything. And so we've actually started working with them. And uh, they have uh, some really wonderful capabilities as well. They have essentially their Barry. Um, and now their Barry, who ironically, our Barry tried to hire in the early 80s. Um, he's at <laughs> Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. He has designed CCDs that were we're literally building today our first round of CCDs for him. So we're essentially Great. the only uh, domestic supplier of CCDs for the government. Internationally, then there's a uh, uh, there's some labs in Europe that build devices that are kind of similar. Um, and uh, I will say, uh, you know, ESA missions tend to. Uh, European space agency missions tend to prioritize using European technology, just like NASA, you know, completely forgivable would want to fly domestic technology <laughs> whenever possible. So we are not, we haven't flown anything on an ESA mission to my knowledge. Um, and same with Japan. So there's very limited capability uh, in the Japanese infrastructure. But they don't come to you. N largely, no. That is correct. And no for. Uh -huh. And and uh, Great, because thanks. we're not a commercial company, we'll keep building them as long as people need them. Charlie, so I just wanted to do a CCD anecdote that uh, 1985. Uh, I was at Colgate University. We were hiring a young astronomer. Well, we were all young men, but anyway, we were hiring a young astronomer, and uh, he uh, he didn't have much to do at a small liberal arts college, but we all saw that CCDs could convert our nice twenty-inch reflector into a real research instrument, and for about five years, uh, we I mean, we had you had to really scavenge to get, or had to, scavenge is the wrong word, you had to scratch hard to get. A C, the CCDs that would go on the image plane of that telescope, but we got them. And all of a sudden he had a cutting edge research instrument and was doing uh, variable star measurements that uh, were quite remarkable for the time for a brief while until the CCDs got even better and other astronomers began to use them quite widely. It was a great, great thing to see. Excellent. Hey, Chris, just, a, just a, a, a question just off the wall. Is it safe to assume that the technologies you're using for looking outward from the Earth into space are applicable to flipping them around and looking inward from space to the ground? Yep. And in fact, um, there's we actually have scientific concepts for that as well. Um, you know, obviously there's uh, national security applications, but exactly, and I and that's why that's why I was being as vague as I was. Yeah, I don't want to get you in trouble. So yeah. back in the uh, '80s, I was involved with CCDs at a company called Iconics and Bill Ricca, which is a division of of uh, Kodak. Kodak had fabricated their own CCDs and they were integrating them into a graphic art camera project. It was very, very clunky with a lot of mechanical uh, aspects to it, which, but it would take you like uh, half an hour to uh, acquire a graphic arts image, let's say for uh, a magazine and so on. Uh, it, it was a linear CCD. So you had about, four, I think 4K was a limit on it. You had to qualify all the, uh, we were building cameras and, and going through the steps. There's a lot of R&D with, with optical engineers and so on and, and getting the quality level up. Uh, but it was all mechanical. So it was a stepper 
you have to illuminate uh, a table and, and step over it to take probably over 10 uh, minutes of pass and then switch filters, color filters between the uh, the green and the red and the and and whatever. Uh, but it would get done. It, it cost about a quarter million dollars for that camera back at the time. I don't think they sold them in much volume, but it, but that, that was mid '80s and and it was commercial back then, at least yeah, I, commercial. Kodak did some of the. Actually, we reference. We allude to some of their fundamental papers. You know, they they made some important discoveries that we allude to even today. Mitch, if I recall, some of that stuff, you, know, you guys went into space also, didn't you, with some DOD work? I, I wasn't in, in involved with those did? projects. Yes, I, I wasn't involved with those projects. But the comp, but the company did. Yeah, uh, Iconics. They did a lot of stuff in imaging. I think. Yeah. Because I thought some of the spy satellites use use things that were Hartwell Avenue based. Yeah, I mean there are a few companies in the area I think that were big into it, right? It was a big company in, in Lexington at the time. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Uh, one last trivia question, Chris, from uh, that that spurred the con the question that uh, um, Jerry asked. The the layers that you use when you build the multi these are basically multi multi layers of yep. of, of, of Technology is still uh, photographic based to build the layers using using uh, photo photo printing for each each metallic layer. Yeah, we're so we're patterning uh, photolithography. We're patterning uh, most of the devices with uh, a fairly relaxed uh, uh, 365 nanometer uh, light source. Um, most of the dimensions on the CCDs we build are uh, 800 nanometers or larger, which is by semiconductor fabrication standards, big. Um, some of our more advanced devices have uh, features that are 150 or 100 nanometers. Um, and so those use 193 nanometer light source. Uh, uh, that's one of our most you know, capable and high-end tools. Um, but yeah, most of it's pretty relaxed for uh, line width uh, you know, for the feature size. Yeah, I was always always amazed by the technology the, the, between the light source and the negative that you use for for printing on on top of these things, how that all works together. I never got, quite got my head around it. Chris, thank you very much for a really great presentation. I think we all appreciate it and, and learned quite a bit. Rich, thank you so much for uh, bringing Chris to our attention.